The Miami Marlins have called up top pitching prospect Yuri Perez to start tonight versus the Cincinnati Reds. What can MLB expect to see from our tall king? Let's talk about it. You are Locked On MLB Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on in to Locked on MLB Prospects, your home for all things minor league baseball. I'm your host, Lindsey Crosby, freelance baseball writer and podcaster. Thank you for making this your first listen every single day. We're probably part of the Locked on Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. And today's episode is made possible by our friends at Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use code Locked on MLB for $20 off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. So, Yuri Perez getting called up by the Miami Marlins. Uh, he will be starting on Friday night tonight versus the Cincinnati Reds. And it's it's a little surprising, yes. I mean, he is completely skipping AAA and will go straight from AA to the bigs. And Yuri Perez will end up being the youngest pitcher in Marlins franchise history when he debuts. His 20th birthday was last month, so he is 20 years and 27 days old as of today. The previous record was Jose Fernandez, 20 years, 250 days when he debuted in 2013. So, he will make a start 6.40 p.m. on Friday against the Reds. I'm going to try to do a little brief video recapping that start at the end of the night or first thing Saturday morning, and then I'm sure we'll talk about it next week. It's one of the top pitching prospects in baseball. But what can you expect to see from Yuri Perez in this outing? And and kind of how did we get here? My everydayers, we talked about him a bit on Wednesday because he made the prospect team of the week. Another example of the MLB locked, locked on MLB prospects bump. We talk about you, you get promoted. That's how this works. But last year, mostly in double A, got 17 games went 3-3 three and three with a 408 ERA. Uh, 75 innings pitched, 106 strikeouts, so 12.7 per nine to 25 walks. Three walks per nine, nine home runs allowed. Was back at AA Pensacola this year, and the reason I say mostly in AA last year was he had a lat strain uh, a little bit later in the year, so he missed some time. He did go down to low A Jupiter, for a rehab appearance, uh, two innings, like one hit, four strikeouts. They were like, yeah, you're fine. Went back to double A. But this year, he's gotten six starts in Pensacola. And if you, my everydayers will remember from, from Wednesday's show, two of those starts were in the last game week. But six starts in double A Pensacola, three and one record, two, three, two ERA in 31 innings pitched, 42 strikeouts, so 12.2 per nine to nine walks, 2.6 per nine, five home runs allowed. His stuff is really good, and the thing about it is it's legitimately four pitches that he can command four strikes. He's incredibly unusual. We called him our tall king. He is six foot eight, and we've talked about it a lot on the show. When you have those extraordinarily tall guys, they usually struggle as far as the proception, understanding where every all the limbs are at the same time, having the, the levers, those long levers trying to be in sync. But Yuri Perez is a fan. He has great control for a pitcher, never mind a six foot eight pitcher. He's kind of a unicorn in that regard. Uh, but the package is like the main features of this pit of this package are the fastball and the changeup. So the fastball sits 97 or so. He can run it up to 100, but he usually sits in the mid to upper 90s with it. You know, he doesn't throw every single one of them at 99. He'll sit 95, 96, 97 at times. Uh, I'd expect in the first inning, you'll see a little bit more velocity. He'll be a little more amped up. Uh, but it's got really good run, uh, really good induced vertical break. So it stays up in the zone compared to where you think it would be. And he did a lot of work last year to, uh, to get better at throwing the fastball up in the zone, still being able to land it for a strike. Coming out of 
the uh, the incredibly high release point that he has being six foot eight, the pitch looks like it's rising in the air as it comes to the plate. Obviously, it's not. It's just not dropping as much as you would expect. But because of the weird angle, it looks like it's going to be over your head for the first half of the flight. I've st- I've sat behind home plate and kind of tried to get a good angle before watching him in double A, trying to see how that looks. So it's a really hard fastball to hit because of the combination of the extension, makes the velocity play up, the release angle, so or, or the release point, given a unique attack angle to the plate, all of that, really hard fastball to hit. Uh, to go along with that, he's got a changeup that is a 70-grade changeup. It sits in the upper 80s. I've seen it as high as 91. It is very, very effective against lefties. If you think about uh, what it's going to do, if you're a lefty hitter, he is throwing it. He's a right-handed pitcher, obviously. So he is throwing it, and the run that a a changeup typically has going to the arm side, or I guess the fade, sorry, it's fade, the fade that it has to the arm side means that he may aim it towards the middle of the plate. You think this is going to be a middle, middle changeup, and it ends up in the other batter's box. I mean, it just run, it just darts and runs away from you the entire time to the plate. Never mind the fact that it's the velocity of some fastballs you see. I mean, it's again, he throws it in the in the upper 80s. It can get as high as 91. It was incredibly effective last year. MLB Pipeline had a piece about the call up. They had a note access to stuff we don't have. 61% swing and miss on the changeup in 2022. It's an absurdly good pitch. Uh, because he it is such a good weapon against lefties, I would imagine you may see the Reds try to stack up more righties in that rotate or in that lineup. Uh, he taught himself a slider last year. Uh, works well against uh, righties. It has uh, it sits in the mid 80s. It's not a giant sweeper. It's got a little tighter break to it. But again, good weapon against righties. It's going to move the other direction from everything else. So your lefty hitters need to be watching for the change. Your righty hitters need to be watching for the slider because it's going to dart down and away from them. And then he's got a spike curveball that I think it could be a plus pitch. I've seen above average. I've seen plus. Uh, Two plane break. He really uses it well early in the count. Try to get an early strike, something like that on it. Uh, It doesn't really have any platoon splits. When you look at Iri Perez's performance, at least this season so far, lefties, 145, 254, 291 slash line. Righties, 151, 167, 358. So less walks to righties, but they get a little bit better outcomes when they do manage to make contact with the ball. He's given up two home runs to lefties, three to righties, eight walks to lefties versus one walk to a righty. So interesting little things there. Kind of curious to see how the Reds approach it, but either way, going to be a great outing. We'll talk about it more about what happened next week. In just a minute, back to our regularly scheduled concept for today's show, revisiting some of the big prospect trades of last year. But first, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at So Rare. It's a fantasy baseball game that is unlike any other because unlike a traditional fantasy baseball game where you go and you draft players and then at the end of the year, you're done, you don't have anything from that but the memories. So Rare is a fantasy baseball game and a marketplace. You can collect, buy, sell, and compete with player cards against global opponents. And win or lose, you still own your cards and there's no cost to play. The more you win, the more you play, the more you advance, you get better cards, you get uh, next like the next level of competition and better rewards. There's two game weeks per week, uh, Monday through Thursday and Friday through Sunday. You go to SoRare.com slash LockedOnMLB. You draft your team of free player cards. You will create a seven-position team. Starting pitcher, relief pitcher, corner infielder, middle infielder, outfielder, extra hitter, and flex that can be anybody but Shohei Otani. Win or lose, you keep the cards. You earn points based on how they do. And at the end of the game week, depending on where you are on the leaderboard, you get 
rare cards, you get merchandise, you get game tickets, you get VIP experiences. It's tons of fun. So head to SoRare.com slash locked on. That's S-O-R-A-R-E dot com slash locked on to draft your team of free player cards, set your lineup, and start competing today to win epic rewards. Again, SoRare.com slash locked on to start playing today. Okay, before Yuri Perez got called up, the original idea behind today's show was going to be at request of the prospectors in the Locked on MLB Prospects Discord, which if you want to join, links in the episode description, links in the show notes. We wanted to go back and relook at some of the trades from the offseason to see were we right or were we wrong when we graded and evaluated the trade. Because my everydayers will remember... I had some pretty strong words about some of these. I do believe I called the Sean Murphy trade the worst trade the Oakland Athletics have made in the modern athletics era. Like, of this sell-off that they have had, trading out Matt Chapman, trading out Olsen, trading out some of these pitchers, I said this was the worst trade of all of them. To recap this trade, it was a three-team trade. The Atlanta Braves, or sorry, the, the only players that left Oakland was catcher Sean Murphy, and uh, reliever Joel Payomps. I believe that's how you say that. Uh, the Brewers were involved, so the Braves got catcher Sean Murphy. The Brewers from Atlanta got catcher William Contreras and pitcher Justin Yeager. Uh, and then they got Joel Payamps from Oakland. The A's got outfielder Asturi Ruiz from the Brewers. And they got starting pitcher Kyle Muller from the Braves, as well as... Uh, minor league pitchers Freddie Tarnock and Roy Salinas from the Braves. And one of the big criticisms I had of this trade when it happened was I said the reason this is a bad trade for the Athletics is you could argue that at best they got the third best player in the trade when they're the one that had the asset. They had Sean Murphy. And instead of getting the best player who was not Sean Murphy back in the trade, that was William Contreras. He was an all-star at DH in 2022, and he goes to the Brewers. Uh, and so, oh, the, the Athletics also got Manny Pena, veteran catcher. I didn't think it was worth mentioning. It's He's not a starter. He's behind Shea Langoliers. Uh, but, so th- how it's gone for everybody. Uh, for the Brewers, William Contreras offensively uh, has played 29 games, 276, 356, 429, three home runs, 10 extra base hits. To go along with that, the Brewers have worked their catching devil magic, and he has gotten significantly better in every single catching category. Atlanta had such little faith that he could be a quality defender behind the plate. He mostly DH'd behind Travis Darno, and then they went out to get Sean Murphy because they didn't think William Contreras They thought he was on the same pace that his brother is on, who ended up just being moved from catcher to DH for St. Louis. He's kind of the scapegoat for a lot of their issues. But, again, the Milwaukee Brewers have catcher devil magic. And so, every single metric that StatCast has when it comes to catching performance, William Contreras has gotten better. Uh, It comes, like, when you look at pop time, He's putting up the best pop times of his career, 1.94, to go to second base. His previous career best was 197 last year. Uh, Most of that improvement has been on the exchange. They've, They've not only gotten the exchange to be quicker, they've also gotten the arm strength to, like, the throw to be harder. So he's transferring the ball faster, and he's throwing the ball harder to second base. Because pop time, some people think pop time is just the catcher getting up. Pop time is from when the ball hits the glove at home to when the ball hits the glove at second. It's the entire process. It's not just how long does it take the catcher to get the ball out of his hand. So your exchange matters, how quickly you actually move matters, and then the strength and accuracy of the throw matters. So he is now... When it comes to pop time, he is now uh, higher on the leaderboard than he was. Uh, When it comes to framing, he has gone... The only areas with which he graded out above average in framing was stealing the high strike. And he was 
uh, I, I say graded out above average. He was at 49.3% in stealing the high strike last year. His overall catcher framing was minus four catcher framing runs last year, according to StatCast, and a 44.9% strike rate. This year, he's up to 47.9% strike rate. He's still doing well at stealing the high strike, but he's gotten significantly better, like 43% to 62% significantly better at the low strike. That's the harder one for uh, for catchers to steal because there's so much more movement usually on pitches down in the zone. He's gotten significantly better at that. His his So his catcher framing runs is now positive. His blocking, he went from minus five blocks above average in 21 and minus three blocks above average in 22 to plus six blocks above average in 2023. So William Contreras has been great for the Brewers in every respect. Uh, Justin Yeager was always destined to be a, an organizational guy. He's got two, he's got two appearances in Double A, a zero ERA, one in the third innings, one strikeout, two walks. Joel Payamps has been a good part of the Brewers bullpen. He's played 15 games, 16 innings pitched, two eight one ERA, which I believe is a career best for him. Uh, for, granted, looking against full seasons, and that's a lot of that's a small sample size, and a lot of stuff can happen. But 16 innings pitched, 15 strikeouts to three walks, has a save. The A's are the ones where they're doing better than I thought they would do on the return, but they're still not at the point where you can even give them a passing grade on the trade. So, uh, one, Freddie Tarnock, the pitcher, strained right shoulder. He's on the 60-day 60 60 day IL. He has not thrown for the Athletics since they got him. Uh, Royber Salinas, six games in A all starts, 471 ERA in 21 innings pitched, 33 strikeouts, so 14.1 per nine. I believe on my notes, I have that as uh, that is one of the better strikeout numbers of his career. To eight walks, 3.4 per nine, two home runs allowed. Still looks promising, still looks like he can develop into a useful piece for the A's. Kyle Muller uh, was one of the two centerpieces of this for the Oakland A's. Uh, left-handed pitcher, 6'7", 250, big boy. Uh, second rounder by the Braves in 2016, I think. But uh, he is, he was, I believe he was the opening day starter. He has started seven games for the A's, and it has not been fantastic. 6'6", 2 ERA, and 34 innings pitched, 21 strikeouts, so 5.6 per nine. I believe that's a career low for him as far as starts. 18 walks, 4.8 per nine. Five home runs allowed. You look at his stat cast. Uh, his, his, most of his pitches are either at or above average velocity. The fastball is right around 93, 94. The slider is above average on velocity. The changeups in that exact same band. You know how like, my everydayers know how I feel about that. I'm not big about having pit, multiple pitches in the same velocity band. The curve is, uh, sits in the, like low 80s. Slider changeup are both around 87. Uh, but, there is just about everything on StatCast for Kyle Muller is blue. 14% swing and miss, or 14th percentile on swing and miss. 5th percentile on strikeouts. Uh, 28th percentile on barrels allowed. Uh, average exit velocity allowed, 6th percentile. Hard hit rate, 8th percentile. Uh, just chase rate, 20th percentile. They're not chasing the breaking pitches. When he throws stuff in the zone, it's getting rocked. The only thing that he's above average at percentile wise on StatCast is fastball spin, 83rd percentile. So a little bit of a struggle there for Kyle Muller. Uh, still has time to turn it around. He's only 25 years old, but not great initial returns for the A's other than they have an arm that can take the ball every fifth day. The other piece of this is Sturry Ruiz, the outfielder. They got him from the Brewers who had just gotten him uh, themselves in a trade. And this is now the second time we've seen the A's make a trade for an outfielder to try to handle that giant center field out there in Oakland. The previous one, they had gotten Christian Pache from the Braves and the Matt Olson deal. He's already been DFA'd. He's now, uh, he moved over to the Phillies. He was actually playing okay. The hitting coach, Kevin Long, did a lot of work there. And then he got hurt and he's out right now. Uh, but, Asturi Ruiz in 37 games. He started, I think, every game of the year for them. 275, 335, 352. No home runs, 
but 10 extra base hits. We knew Ishiri Ruiz was not going to hit for power, so that's not that surprising. Four walks to 29 strikeouts, 17 of 19 on stolen bases. If I have it right, he leads either the American League or all of baseball in steals with 17, and he leads in games started with 37. Some of that's just schedule stuff, but he's out there every day. Another situation where when you look at the stat cast, a lot of the offensive stuff is blue. Uh, some of the defensive stuff, his arm strength's just above average, 59th percentile. His out's above average, 63rd percentile. So he's playing an above average center field out there in Oakland. Sprint speed, 97th percentile, was incredibly fast. But a lot of the offensive metrics, again, a lot of blue. 7th percentile in hard hit, which, again, we knew that was an issue. 10th percentile in barrel, so... We knew that was an issue, but second percentile in walks. He's not walking a lot. He's not striking out a ton. 72nd percentile in strikeouts. He's not striking out a ton. I mean, granted, he's got 29 in 37 games, but there's a lot of guys doing a lot worse than that. He's just, he's not necessarily as able to get his speed into games because he's not walking hardly at all. Uh, Again, he's got four walks in 37 games. So, It reminds me a lot, again, not a comp, we don't do comps, but looking at him reminds me of, like, I think your ceiling, what you're looking at is a Kevin Kiermeyer type, right? Could give you very good defense with some work, he's not as good defensively as Kevin Kiermeyer, Uh, could could do some work, and then could grow into power if you develop it right. He's listed at six foot one, uh, 169. A little bit of physical development you can do. Again, only 24. But I don't think as of right now you can regrade this and say, yes, the Oakland A's absolutely get a passing grade on this trade right now because Sean Murphy's one of the best players in all of baseball at the moment. He is batting 288, 428, 613. Uh, nine home runs, 18 extra base hits, 32 RBIs. Uh, his 32 RBIs leads the league. His 613 slugging leads the league. His 1040 OPS leads the league. His 178 OPS plus leads the league. Uh, And he's been very good defensively. So it's kind of hard to say that, like, the Braves won, the Brewers won. They probably both get A's for this. And the Athletics, as of now, still get a failing grade for this trade. In just a minute, we're going to go back and check another couple trades that we have floating out there. Marlins and Twins made one. The Marlins and the A's made one. And then... The Angels and the Phillies made a couple. But first, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Game Time. Buying tickets to events, uh, whether it's sports, music, comedy, whatever it is, it shouldn't be stressful. You should just be like, I want to go to this. Let's go grab tickets and go. And that's what Game Time is for. They have deals on tickets right up to the day of the event and the Game Time guarantee. You will always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for your event, for less than what you paid from Game Time, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. It is the fastest growing ticketing app in the country for a reason. You can get images of your seat before you buy, so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. You buy the tickets in a matter of seconds. Last time I tried it, it was two taps, and I was done. And they go directly to your phone. You never have to dig through email. It pops up right in the app. Here are your tickets for your event. So, snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use code LOCKEDONMLB for $20 off your first purchase. Terms and conditions do apply, but again, create an account, redeem code LOCKEDONMLB for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. Okay, so looking at a couple other trades uh, that were done that involved prospects or former prospects last year, One of the big ones that we had a strong take on was the Marlins and the Twins. So it was uh, the Twins sent infielder Luis Arise, who won the Silver Slugger last year, to the Marlins, and they received back right-hand pitcher Pablo Lopez, infielder Jose Salas, and international free agent who had just signed, like I think that year, uh, Byron Churio from the Marlins. So... Uh, one, the Marlins are doing great with this return, right? So Arise, 34 games, 398, 457, 488. Not hitting for a ton of power, one home run, eight extra base hits. One of those is a triple, which he's not a very fast guy. But 398 batting average, 
457 on base. The issue that that Marlins team had for the longest time was an inability to make consistent contact. And so they leaned into that and they got Luis Arise. Uh, he's got 13 walks to only nine strikeouts uh, and one for two on stolen bases. He's mostly playing second base. He's played a little bit of first base. He's DH some. But as of now, in the short term, this deal is a win for the Marlins. I still have concerns about the long-term health of his knees. He's had multiple knee issues in the past, but short term so far, the Marlins uh, are getting a passing grade and probably a pretty good grade. I mean, a, 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 a probably a B, if not an A minus for this trade so far. For the Twins, Byron Churio, complete lottery ticket. Okay. He was in the DSL last year. He'll be coming stateside this year for rookie ball as just a matter of kind of the way things work on this show, we don't really talk a lot about guys in uh, in the Dominican. It's just, we've already, we're already trying to cover 120 teams, and we're a small group over here. So we kind of just don't even necessarily worry about that. We'll update on him as he gets through rookie ball. Uh, Jose Salas, 23 games in high A. 157, 255, 217. One home run, three extra base hits. Eight walks to 24 strikeouts. Seven and nine on stolen bases. The defense has looked decent. Uh, the speed is working out offensively in a bit of a slump. It's lower than his career numbers. I think Jose Salas is going to be fine with a little bit of adjustment. He hit in high A for the Marlins last year. He hit 230, 319, 340 in 48 games. He is just now 20 years old. You've got time. No need to worry. Still a top 10 prospect for the Twins. Pablo Lopez has absolutely worked out for the Twins. Eight games, two and two record, 347 ERA in 49 and a third innings. 62 strikeouts with 11.3 per nine, which is a career high for Pablo Lopez, by the way. 14 walks, 2.6 per nine, five home runs allowed. The Twins signed him to a four-year, $73.5 million extension. So average annual value of $18.4 million. They bought out a couple arbitration years. Fantastic deal for both sides. He gets some security. He gets to hit free agency still. Uh, the the Twins get some cost certainty and get to keep a guy around for a couple years now. The big changes for Pablo Lopez is, one, he added a sweeper. We've talked on the show at My Everydayers. Remember us talking about the sweeper and how good of a pitch it is. But another part of this as well is his four-seam fastball is up to 95 miles an hour now. He went from below average velocity to above average velocity on it. He currently sits... Uh, 73rd percentile on velocity for the fastball. And he already had, he's 6'4", he already had 95th percentile extension. So it's playing up off of that 95 miles an hour. So I think that's a bigger change than the sweeper. But either way, uh, he's gotten significantly better. The Twins get a, a passing grade for this, if B, if not an A, because uh, Pablo Lopez, the main piece of this, is doing well, uh, and then you have hopes for Churio. Salas is bringing the score down a little bit, I guess probably a B plus uh, or an A minus, but you still have time for the, both those guys to work out. A couple other interesting trades. Prospect for uh, like a, a swap of former top prospects, the, speaking of Miami, they sent outfielder J.J. Blade to Oakland. They got relief pitcher A.J. Puck back. So Blade just got called up recently, eight games in Oakland, 379, 419, 793, three home runs, three extra base hits, two walks to five strikeouts, no stolen bases uh, attempted. He's not even tried to steal once. Uh, Blade, change of scenery guy. It's working so far. Very small sample size, but they were going to just get rid of AJ Puck, and instead they got something for him, another guy who can partner with Ruiz to cover a ton of ground out there in that outfield. Uh, Miami for AJ Puck. In the bullpen, 15 games, he's 3-1, 307 ERA in 14 and two-thirds innings, 19 strikeouts to three walks, and he's got six saves in six attempts. He's not blown a save yet. He did blow a lead against the Cubs last week. Like, like in the eighth inning, gave up, pitched a third of an inning, gave up like two runs or something, and they lost the lead and ended up losing the game. But he didn't blow a save. So six for six on save attempts so far. That trade seems to have worked out well for everybody. Uh, Logan Ohapi for Brandon Marsh. That was the Phillies and the Angels. That happened last year during the season, but I still want to discuss it. Obviously, you guys know how I feel about Logan Ohapi, who was out for the year with a shoulder injury. Uh, in his 16 games, 283, 339, 547. 
He hit four home runs, had six extra base hits total with uh, four walks to 15 strikeouts. I like Logan Ohapi. He'll be back next year. He'll be better than ever. Uh, Brandon Marsh has been a, a man on fire, a man possessed since he got into Philly and got with Kevin Long, the hitting coach. Has done a great job. 35 games this year. 311, 416, 575. Four home runs, 16 extra base hits, including a MLB leading four triples. Uh, 18 walks to 37 strikeouts and one for one on stolen bases. Also playing pretty good defense. So that's a change of scenery trade that uh, looks like it worked out for both teams as well. Or okay, correction, not a change of scenery trade. Uh, Philadelphia needed the center fielder last year. And so that's a trade where they gave up a promising player to get a player. And then they made a former top prospect better than what he had shown during his time in LA. His career slash line in LA, 239, 299, 354. They brought that slugging up 150 points. Brought the on base up uh, 66 points and brought the, the batting average up almost like almost 60 points. So enjoy your weekend. Mailbag's coming on Monday. Reminder, if you have questions for the show, I'm on Twitter at Crosby Baseball. Show's on Twitter at Locked on Farm. You can email us, LockedOnMLBProspects at gmail.com, or drop your questions in the Locked on MLB Prospects Discord. Links in the episode description. Links in the show notes. Until tomorrow's show, remember, it's always a great time to pay a minor leaguer.